Okay, we're starting. Self-publishing podcast episode number 61. Welcome to the self-publishing podcast, where if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. And now, here are your hosts, three guys who are down with OPP, Johnny, Sean, and Dave. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the self-publishing podcast, the podcast that's all about how to get your words out into the world without contending with agents, publishers, or the other gatekeepers in traditional publishing. I'm Johnny B. Truant. Boy, I turned that down too fast. It's kind of disorienting. And uh, with me are Sean Platt and David Wright. Uh, yeah. So we're going to try again to have David Gogren on. This time we actually talked to him. So for some reason our guests don't just psychically figure out that they're on the air. I, it's really a failing of a lot of people that they don't psychically figure it out. No response from. <laughs> well, I think no. I'm you gotta pick to... me up because otherwise it sounds like I'm a cock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're trying to do. <laughs> no, I was just paying attention to my uh, my little we're, blue. We're playing with our tools, I, I... <laughs> like normal, such boys. So, um, how about that local sports team? Yeah, we actually uh, we 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 talked to David yesterday ahead of time. La- last time we like talked to David like three four weeks ago. And said, "Hey, you want to be on a certain day?" And then we 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 lined it up, but I don't know if everything was confirmed. We thought it was, so then you know, like we didn't email him like the day before, like we should have, like good hosts. <laughs> and then we're like, you know, the day of, the minute of, we're like, "Hey, are you coming on?" And he's like, "What?" <laughs> See, it's okay. We rolled Worst with the show ever. <laughs> the only casualty is I know people have been asking about a show on Beats, and when we had an empty show last week, I wasn't ready to discuss Beats, uh, although I have listened to the show where Dave berates us for our failure several times, which is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to tell you, I came back strong swinging, so. It uh, me? Watch out. We're on, no, on the new, on the, no, 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 no you, you clearly won last time. On the, um. On the pilots, like I've done three since we talked. I did our other funny one, hopefully. Everybody gets divorced. Oh, no, I guess just two. And then I just finished. So, Sean, this is ready for you, Robot Proletariat. <laughs> I'm so hyped. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm so hyped. Do you want to give the log line for this? Uh, I don't know that I know the log line for this. Oh, what is a log line? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, um, that's where Dave, you actually want to have that's Dave. That's when there's back. a long line at the bathroom. Hey, Dave, uh, Johnny doesn't know this yet, so you could tell the story about the phone call. That's pretty cool news. I want to talk about that without saying who called us, correct? Uh, well, I don't this sounds think like it a matters. great discussion. A, yeah, I know. Like Dave and his secrecy. No, just you could no, say. I, I know. I don't think you should say who it was. We 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 got a call from some television producers. Ooh, regarding uh, yesterday's gone and you know possibly bringing it to v- TV. Uh, it, it's fine. We, we we were talking to these people, and th- to me the conversation went one way. To Sean, it went the other way. <laughs> but to me, I was just seeing like all the negatives. Like you know, it was shocking. It, it, was, impos- <laughs> it was impossible to see like. Uh, to really explain our story well, and I think we failed there to like really pitch it. They they started reading it, and halfway through the first season, they they liked it so much they wanted to call us and talk to us to quote begin a dialogue. So we're talking, and then you know they don't know how the rest of the story goes, and then I'm trying to explain it, and I'm like, oh my god, it's the most convoluted clusterfuck ever. I'm like really doing a good job selling it. So and, and Sean's like, there's no way this could ever be on TV. You know, we got we got a we got a serial killer rapist necrophiliac. <laughs> So You'd have I'm, to sell out, which <laughs> luckily I imagine you're, you know, you guys are probably okay with that, right? Selling out. <laughs> well, the, the the thing was, it was a it was a production company, and they have a deal with one network, but that doesn't mean anything as far as like they could produce something for for any network and shop it around. And it was important during that first conversation to state that look, this is not this is not right for like one of the. Networks. This is not good for Family Channel. Yeah, all right? <laughs> this isn't a network show. Like, there's too many concessions you would have to make with the source material. Um, so HBO, Showtime, um, not even AMC, because because oh, the language. I think AMC, no AMC would do it. You don't Dude, you don't watch enough AMC. You watch okay. the killing. Watch I'm the not, killing. <laughs> I'm not talking about the violence. Yes, I'm sure that's fine. But there's language. Oh, they boundaries. got language in the killing too. Not the things that Barisio said. Oh, nobody <laughs> says it anywhere outside of like X-rated porno theaters. It's no, it's cute not that you think Deadwood, that... dude. Deadwood. Uh, Deadwood. The, 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 I love the, that you're dismissing every person in the world who said 
the book was better or something like that. Like usually those are different <laughs> things, you know. No, it better be exactly word for word. <laughs> you can't fit that in the scene with the coffee table. Oh, well, forget I, you guys. I don't think I don't think Baricio should be toned down. Like he is, he is who he is. That's the character. So anyway, um, it's important <laughs> to make that clear from the beginning. Uh, HBO, yes. ABC, no. Even though they were home to Lost. Like I, I would love to have a show on ABC. I wouldn't love uh, Yesterday's Gone to be on ABC. Well, that's very exciting. I look forward to. Hearing yeah, Sean's gonna fuck this up. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway. Uh, uh, no, that was that was essential to get that over in the conversation. And look, the point is, if producers are calling us now, they'll call us again. There's no hurry to do this. It's there, there's a hurry to do it right. But if that takes another year, two years, whatever, like it'll happen. And um, you don't jump the first time the phone rings. You you calmly take the call and you evaluate how it's going to affect your current business and your future business because we're trying to build something bigger than you know a pilot. Bigger and, than God. And we've we've you know we've written a lot of pilots like and and that's that's clear. Like white space is perfect for. Um, for, yeah, uh, we we, for we did we did we did try to steer them towards white. Space. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I would um, love to see white space on TV. Yeah, and 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 Dave, um, you know, Dave, I think Dave would have liked it if I just had talked about yesterday's gone, but that wasn't the point. Like, no, 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 no. I I was fine with that actually. So they, you know, they called us about about yesterday's gone, but we're clear. no, no. I remember I got I got annoyed with you when you were talking about for nevermore, and I'm like, shut the fuck up about no. for never. Nobody gives a fuck about for never. <laughs> Dude, but that's where you're wrong. Like that story had that story had a place to go, and it was at its conclusion. And the point is, we wrote great YA that's perfect for TV because no concessions need to be made with that property. That property could be transport. That property could be given to a screenwriter and said, "Make this for ABC, NBC, CBS. It doesn't matter." Um, and that could, a teleplay could be made of that. Very simply, I I, I just felt like. I, I felt like we should have narrowed it down and talked about just two things and not kind of like gone all over the place. And Dude, Forevermore that, felt like a little too far to me. That was five minutes into the conversation. We opened with Forevermore. No, we so, didn't. <laughs> yeah, we did. We talked. No, we did not. You, no. What were no. we talking about before Forevermore? Yesterday's gone. Right. So the first stray was Forevermore. No, white space was the first stray. Guys, talk, talk about, about more about the, deep, the direction of this phone call. Can no, I can right. I get the exact map? whatever? No, okay. okay <laughs> so well, the the point let's, is let's end the conversation. The point I, is I've lost really, interest in the direction no, of the conversation. Okay. The point oh. is it went really well. They were interested in what we had to say. We talked about a lot of projects. They have to finish reading one, get to another. And now they know, like, they were only focused on yesterday's gone, but the tone of their email was, you know, like, we'd like to know more about you and what you do. And what we do is very interesting to people like that because they produce the visual versions of what we create. So it had to be a bigger conversation. And, um, <laughs> And uh, and I, I felt really positive about it when we hung up. And Dave was just like, oh, my God, that was the worst. I did not say that. We're no. never hearing. No, it, okay, his exact words were, do you think we'll ever hear from them again? <laughs> that was his exact words. I assume every conversation like that is just like every first date I had. <laughs> I just feel so sorry for you. Like, even when... <laughs> Even when it's terrific, oh, no, 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 wait, it, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Even when terrific things are happening for you, regularly, <laughs> you're just like, "Fuck, man, when's the rug being pulled? When's the rug being pulled, motherfucker?" Like no, you're this, so ready. This is my take. I never, ever, ever, ever get excited about something until shit is inked on the dotted line. There's money in my bank account. Until then, everything is speculation, and I don't fucking speculate because that does nothing but bring your hopes up when wow. they're only going to get crushed. I live every day in the way that you said that you don't. Like, every day in anticipation of something awesome happening, It's so, we're so the opposite person. I, I, I know. I just, I, like, I'm genuinely, like, I love you to pieces, but I'm so, I feel so bad for you. Like, I just want to give you a hug. <laughs> okay, man. If you gave me a hug, I would wonder what was in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> you got like a knife or scissors. <laughs> I'm just saying, dude. So, I'm. I feel. I feel bad for you, truly. So I have an update that says. We have a guest, Marvel, don't we? <laughs> I, yeah. In, in just a minute. Oh, uh, in just a minute, I'll invite him. I just want to say quickly that we are horrible people with your voicemails, and um, 
<laughs> my, <laughs> well, it's, out your voice. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It, it's it's a shame because um, my I'm going to pass the buck. So uh, Natalie was uh, my assistant. Natalie was on vacation last week and stuff. So she just gave me a ton of voicemails that would have been great to do a voicemail show. Um, but we have guests this week and next week. So we're not going to get too many voicemails. And the earliest one on here is May 13th. <laughs> oh, Let, wow. Let's do Better Off Dead for voicemails. Oh, well, that's a great idea. But the, I thought we weren't going to make Better Off Undead SPP2. No. Like, we don't oh, want to make does, people... Yeah, that does force people to listen if they like yeah, voicemails. We don't, yeah, we, we don't, don't want to force that. anyone. And what if it, we would be sacrificing Dave's butt? <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I just saw a comment right before this started about how how some mom was in the car. They turned Dave, what's, oh, Dave's butt oh, up no. because it was so funny. Oh. <laughs> and his his rage in the middle of the street. <laughs> oh no! I'm trying to. I'm doing the thing where I try to invite David Gogren, and it it kind of hangs. Like oh, that that's always a good time. Oh, I love it when it says "Oops, try again." That's my favorite. Oh, damn <laughs> stupid ass. Can either of you guys invite on Google? Uh, Why does it? No. Ever since they did this redesign, it's a real bitch. It used it's to be so simple. Yeah, no, it's, no, no, it's not even that it's confusing. It just... It says let me, you how invited. do I say this? Huh? Oh, it, it does say I've invited well, people? No, now it doesn't. Now it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, awesome. they didn't... Hey, David Gogren. Oh, I, if I don't invite him, then he can't join. That's the problem. Oh, fuck! So if, he's, if you're listening, we're trying... Um, I think we're we're probably not going to be able to do this thing where we invite people midstream. I think we're going to have to start with them every time, which is going to be a little different. But this is this is like the third or fourth time that this bullshit has happened. Fortunately, in the past, it has indeed resolved itself. So we'll see. But we are. Hey, David, we're trying to invite you. Oh, so uh, the beam came out today, which is and, awesome. No, yesterday. And it came out yesterday, and we sent an email with. Two announcements, as if. Oh yeah, Lexi's um <laughs> uh, adult video came out today too. Oh, that's um, funny. Actually, Lexi's adult video came out today. Beam came out yesterday, and they are both really, really awesome. And if you're listening to this to this live, they're both ninety nine cents, um, which is also awesome. But uh, the beam is the beam is good. I'm really, really proud of that. And um, adult video is very funny. You will laugh for sure. Uh, damn it. So, Dave, can you email David and just let him know we're not being total cocks and ignoring him? I, I just said he's trying to send it now. Do you see anything? So, Yeah, I, I it's really because I, we're doing the YouTube thing and everything, and I'm just, if I have to cancel this and restart, then it's, that well, I sucks. think we're going to have you two YouTube videos. Oh, <laughs> uh, we could do that, part one and part two. Go ahead, go here for part two. Um, if Google would just work, that would be really awesome. I would be down with that. Thinking about sending a support request. Yeah, if you could make your service work, that would be something that I would really be down with. <laughs> oh, it does say invitation posted. Yay! Just Holy batting on fuck! The Someone at Google heard you. Well, I, oh, they're I always listening. In, in, um, in the email that Sean crafted for uh, Realm and Sands, it was all wink, wink. It was pretty funny about adult video. So he, he, he first of all, he jizzed about the beam, which was great. And then he said, oh, and by the way, we got this other thing that Lexi is doing. And I don't know. He just went on. Like, what was the line in there about she could just tack a sex scene on the end and take all the credit? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. But that was a fun email to write. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed yeah. writing that one. Oh, I you know what? It down. I, I just we should I decided do to tell my list, but I really couched it. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. We should do an email show. Okay, okay I don't know what that means. Got it. Is Johnny frozen? I no. 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 Oh, we should do what an do email mean? show, like, a, like talk about how you talk to your list, like how you write an email <laughs> out, like what what kinds of things oh, but are I important. Don't, I I yeah. All right. I guess I I care less about that now. I just steal your copy. <laughs> well, <laughs> awesome. That really helps. The well, listeners. no, I did. <laughs> yeah. Well. um... No, I mean, I did. I did just recreate. I just did just create a, a, a like a zine thing, like a, a weekly magazine. Okay, thing Dave said. What do you call that? Google is making them update a plugin. So, oh man, <laughs> wait a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we got to stop the midstream inviting. It's nothing but trouble the whole time. Um, what what happened with me when I, I had to update the plugin is it it just wouldn't work. Like awesome. it would ask me to plug, update the plugin and then I'd try. Um, anyway. 
<laughs> uh, but what I was saying about my email was that I hadn't. We but we've been talking. The Realm and Sands list is a lot of this podcast listener, so they've been hearing about adult video and they understand that it's a Lexi project, and they've kind of getting gotten to know Lexi and they know that we kind of created the concept and all that stuff, and um, so that you could you could pitch that to people and and you asked them about it last week. My on my list, I've been very tentative, and I realized. Ah, uh, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to ask him. I'm just going to go ahead and, and send it to him, too, because it's it's hilarious. And, you know, we were involved, kind of, and... But I, I, I don't know if you saw my email. It's just like, just so you know, what you're getting, like, in, in red type, <laughs> before anybody clicks anything and gets mad at me. Okay, well, wow. what, what's the URL for this so I can send it out to Twitter? People are wanting it. URL for what? For the live stream right now. I, YouTube. I don't know. Uh... uh <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Is there, there's a URL for a hangout? Yeah, for the video. Yeah. <laughs> All right, never mind. Why do people, Johnny's a oh, total geez. giver today? Did, just look up Johnny D- B. True and David. YouTube. David, David is now it. restarting his PC, so <laughs> it should be a momentary. <laughs> awesome. That's uh, that's okay. Well, what else? Oh, here, you know what I'll do? I'll go ahead and play one of these. How about that? Think All we can right. Do that? Yay! All right, let's let's go ahead and play one. This is a question for the self-publishing podcast. It's Carl Sinclair calling from Australia. A question for Sean and Dave about serials and the Kindle serial um, project or program. Um, I've been writing a bunch of books for a while and I'm just about ready to start publishing them um, all. I have a serial that I've written that I was considering putting forward Kindle project with Amazon now that they're taking submissions, especially overseas submissions. Just wanted to know the opinion of how much benefit they think they've got from the two serials that they've had with 47 North. I imagine mostly it would have been from the marketing boost from Amazon. The lower um, money that they've made on those books per episode, is it worth going down that route? Or do you think that for your first few books out, you should just try and go your own way and go for the higher royalties? Thanks for your time, guys. Love the show. See ya. Anyone else here go your own way and your head? Yo, yo, run way. Oh, that's exactly right. YouTube takedown notice in three, two, one. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. I got to dip uh, back. I have a broken well, I, I would choose not to answer that because it was for you guys, so go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely worth it. Uh, one of our serials did better than the other. One, they promoted better than the other. Z, they promoted monsters. They did not promote as well. Sean just vanished. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. He, he's had crappy internet since he moved. Anyway, uh, yes, I would say it's definitely worth it to, uh, to sign up with any of the Amazon Kindle serials because even, even if the book doesn't do extremely well or even if the royalty is less, uh, you will still get a lot of people to notice you that you might not have otherwise. Uh, I would consider any loss if there was any. I mean, we we made good money on it. So, but I would consider any loss of what you would have made on your own, just advertising costs, just to get out there to to new people. It's always worth it, um, in my opinion, anyway. At least right now. So. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop um, typing I'd... this in the chat and just tell you out loud that your connection sucks balls. Yeah, I know, dude. I like, well, what can I do? <laughs> Sorry. So, so you need um, to move. <laughs> um, no, I just need to get hooked up. I'm not hooked up with Time Warner yet, and so I just like. Oh, I you're still pirating Sorry. internet? All right. Yeah. Well, I, I no, I paid for it. Like, I just haven't had it hooked up yet. So, <clears throat> anyhow, um, uh, at least I'm not in the business center. <laughs> I can say fuck. Um. Yeah. Uh, so I would say if I could go back in time, um, I would do one serial rather than two um, with 47 North because I think more than anything, it crowded our, um, our lineup. But having said that, uh, I would recommend doing one to pretty much anybody. Um, like Dave said, you get exposure in a different way. Um, and I think it's probably the right move for most authors. Um, even if you can produce on your own. I think that I think that from what I can see, some of the smartest authors are doing this hybrid thing. Um, you know, CJ and, and uh, Joanna, for sure. Um, Hugh, with what he did, getting his print deal. 
Um, so, so yeah, I think a hybrid thing really does make sense if for no other reason than the experience. You will learn something. You will be exposed to people that you wouldn't get on your own, and that's worth it. And um, I think they put it well that it, you think of it as advertising costs. That's that's a great way to think of it because there are stupid ways to spend money on advertising, and that's not one of them. Like even if your book doesn't do as well. Cash wise, like a promo that they won't accept you for, maybe that kind of advertising. <laughs> yeah, that's just a drag. Twice. So anyway, that's it. Is uh, has he responded, Dave? Like, is he having trouble? Because we can always switch to Skype, just bail on the YouTube video. Uh, or I can't hear Dave. Uh, are you Bremen, or you start a PC? So. <laughs> oh, so he's still restarting. Okay. Uh, well, if you get I an email, heard since so. Okay, if you get an email, probably because his PC is restarting. If you get an email um, that says, I can't get on, then we'll just bail on the YouTube video and just go and finish on Skype. That's fine. Okay. And I think we have more time if he has more time. So, uh, Although it is really frustrating to, like, because this is going to, like, I want to apologize to him for Google. Like, you know, thanks for coming on our podcast and being pissed off for 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, I can play another one. You want me? To, Cal had another question yeah, on the same yeah, day. This oh, oh, hold on. Yes. Awesome. So, hello. 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 Is the mic working? Hello. Yes. Okay. Have you tried speaking yet? Can't hear you. If so, uh oh. Can't hear. So you. much for the yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might be in the yeah. the, uh, the 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 setting the, the settings the gear in the upper right. I am pausing the audio. I'm gonna email him as well. Okay. It's I don't know. If, can you hear us? Okay. Do you see it, the settings icon in the upper right? Does it give you the audio choice? Everyone's frozen. Yeah, no, I'm not frozen, I don't think. We're just silent. <laughs> I love Google. <laughs> I did pause the audio, so only only YouTube is wondering what's up right now. Still, Sorry, YouTube. Yeah, still... Uh, we don't suck as much as Google Still does. nothing on the audio. Are you muted, perchance? Is the, you might have come in muted. The up, the, is the microphone thing in the upper right, is it red? Because if it's red, you're muted. Sometimes when there's enough people in the call, they bring new people in muted. Yeah, click on the microphone and talk. See if anything happens. <laughs> Maybe it's just an inexplicable muting. We can always switch to Skype if this isn't working. Or Chris, yep. no, wait, maybe we can't. We just, told, we just, you know, I sent, you know, hey, watch <laughs> us on YouTube. And <laughs> <laughs> We're so sorry. Watch us suffer and struggle on oh, wow, YouTube. Yeah. <clears throat> Is, um, I would have already left a one-star review. <laughs> you, you can... If Please you, don't. <laughs> If you open the chat, you can. If you need to talk to us, there's a chat on the left. If there's something we can help with, or we can just have you on Skype. Does anybody know sign language? <laughs> <laughs> We're so sorry, <laughs> Dave. I had a gr uh, my first my first morning with Z went really really well. It was awesome. Awesome. Did you read it all, the oh first boy. one? I don't know what to do. No, and I absolutely you... have to, just for tonal reasons. Oh. I, I watched an episode of Downton Abbey before writing Robot Proletariat. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> I can't so wait to read that. Are we, are we, is this not going to work? No? Should we just do Skype? Just do Skype. I'm going to open Skype in preparedness. Okay. Does, does David have Skype? 
Oh, that's a good question. Okay, yeah. yes. <laughs> yes. I love the sign language. You want to email Johnny your Skype <laughs> first <user> name <laughs> or put it in the chat window here if you Yeah, chat, chat would be there. easier. Uh and to our YouTube audience, uh, looks like we will be going away. Actually, what we can do is we can do what we did. You with, waited um, for nothing. <laughs> what we can do is is what we did with Sean's mom. Oh, you can call him and <laughs> stay on YouTube. Right, we can stay on. Oh, we just wow. Want a video. Wow, we're utilizing. Oh, that's all. Like motherfuckers. <laughs> all right, so I do see. Uh, How I do motherfuckers do utilize technology? <laughs> Okay, so I do have I do have several. Oh man, this is funny. I said I'm gonna find the David Gogren who's in Ireland, and like they all are. It's a bunch. <laughs> He's cloned himself. Uh, David, can you enter your Skype in the chat? Okay. <clears throat> this is gonna be our highest rated YouTube video ever. <laughs> What do you bet Garrett's angry right now? <laughs> What's up, Garrett's butt? <laughs> He's got his lotion well, already. I got like... No order. Uh, let's see interactions. I don't know oh, which of these. Garrett said this is riveting, <laughs> asshole. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it not our fault. It's Google's fault. And ZC Bulger, more tech issues than... Oh, SCRT. no, that's... He's, he's showing it to us. Do you, can you have the chat window? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. I can no, see I that. Don't... Okay. Yeah, see. We're not seeing anything in the chat if that's what you're asking. Oh. Um, can all you right, I'll tell you what. Johnny? Here, I'll tell you. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> I love Google. All right, hold on. Let me uh, let me get my let me get my email up here. Yeah, if you email it to me, I can I can do it. Oh, I see. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Got it. I got it. All right. All right. Oh, so it says your mic has been muted due to the number of participants, but you should still should be able to unmute it if that's the case. Press the microphone. Your mic button. Yeah, to the upper to the upper right above the the upper right corner of the window there's a mic button and it should be red if it's muted. Is it not red? Can you hear me now? No! Oh! Oh! Hallelujah! Oh my god! <sighs> Excellent. Uh, we, are, okay. we apologize. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you start okay, the very, audio very back up, John? <laughs> Sorry? You start okay, the I'm audio very, back up. Uh. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, let me resume it. Uh, let me resume the audio. All right, resuming the audio. Thanks to David Gogren for joining us. We just had uh, a riveting section on the YouTube video all about trying to get that connection. Learning going. Google Hangouts with David Gogren. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks for being on. Uh, we've all read, I believe Sean finally finished it. We all read yeah. your book, Let's Get Visible. And um, I was, it was one of those things where I, it made me feel dumb, which is good. Like I was like, <laughs> oh, look at all this stuff that I don't know and that I'm not doing. Um, it it actually made me stupider writing it and and editing it especially. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is the most important? Like, if you were to distill, I mean, I know that there's a ton of stuff in the book, but if you, what do you think is the most singular important thing that people may or may not be paying attention to in terms of, or what do they need to know? I, that's like the broadest question ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, there's a number of ways you could answer that. Um, I, I'm I'm surprised all the time the amount of authors who haven't even started a mailing list, which is which is pretty basic stuff, and even like quite successful ones. Um, so if anybody hasn't done that, uh, they should do that right away. It's never too late to start a mailing list, and and you know it's it's the it's the most powerful tool at your disposal, and you know um, it can really launch your book into the charts. It's also the easiest for what you have to put into it compared to what you get back out. Oh, exactly. Like it takes what half an hour to set it up, and then it's there just passive collecting emails at the back of your books. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's no reason not to do it. It doesn't cost anything either. You know, and and anyone can set one up. But uh, in terms of in in terms of less basic stuff, um, although this is still a pretty basic topic, categories. Um, authors aren't drilling down to the most granular subcategory that's most suitable for their work, and they're missing out on huge visibility opportunities every time they get a spike in sales. I um, have a oh sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go on, go on. Oh, I was going to say that I have a very specific 
question about that actually because this is we've we've played that was what hit me by the way was the first thing was like categories that's what I wanted to pay attention to uh, but the question I always have about categories is so for instance we have a series called Unicorn Western Sean and I do and it we originally put it in westerns and fantasy and it was it was in subcategories it wasn't like general westerns um, Although I think westerns is as granular as it gets, it might be. It might be. I think. And then west uh, at fantasy we. Yeah, we I don't think there's. Fantasy. I don't think there's a sub western. Yeah. Okay, so that's what we did. But those are both rather large categories. So what we ended up doing was it's in. Is it in? It's, I think it's in epic fantasy and satire. and satire. So the question that I have is satire is easy to rank in, but I always wonder, is that because people are like do you get a lot of exposure there or is it the sort of thing where because it's a small category maybe the exposure is worth I don't know if people are people watching satire that those well, little categories um, obviously some of these more niche categories are going to get far less eyeballs and you could be in the top 10 on in a, in a very very niche subcategory but it might do nothing for you because nobody is trolling those lists looking for new books to read so it, it takes a little bit of experimentation to find to find something which you can chart in and which will generate some sales for you. Um, but it's a good idea to to look through the whole category list and try and identify a few different potential subcategories for your work because um, it gives you an opportunity to experiment which ones will drive more sales for you and which ones you can actually chart in given your current sales level. But on top of that, it's it's often good to freshen up your categories every few months, particularly if you you're doing something like going on a lot of free runs. Um, then by switching to another category, you get an opportunity to put yourself into a whole in front of a whole new set of eyeballs. Can you talk a little bit about the the, the category? Um, I guess the category upgrading, but what struck me was the idea that it was almost like ratcheting. Like you would, <laughs> if you moved up in a category, then a lot of times it made sense to time a change to a new category to take advantage of those increased sales levels. Well, yeah, I'll give you an example. I, I have a historical novel out, and its natural home would be historical fiction and literary fiction. Um, both of those categories are incredibly competitive. You need to be ranking below uh, 2,000 or 2,500 to even hit the back of the chart, uh, which, which I don't normally do outside of a promotion. So um, outside of a promotion, I'll switch at least one of those categories to something where you require a lower sales level to chart. Before promotion, where I know I'm going to be selling enough to get below 2,000 in the rankings, I'll switch back to those categories because they are actually high visibility categories in that lots of readers use them to search for new books. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that that's awesome. That's really smart. What what struck me about this, and by the way, um, David's book, Let's Get Visible, is if you want a short link to it on Amazon, it's selfpublishingpodcast.com slash visible. Um, and it's... It's, I mean, it's so fantastic. good. It's so so good. It um, really and, is. And really, it's but, it's um. Any listener of the show can benefit, like one hundred percent of you. And we yeah. get we get a lot of email asking us, uh, "Hey, can you tell us the basics about self publishing?" And I am certainly not going to answer the basics on self publishing in every fucking email <laughs> I get. So I always point people. I say, "Go get David Gogren's book. Let's get digital. It explains yeah. everything you need to know. It's one of the best books." Uh, one of the two yeah, but this that I digs in remember. just so much. Yeah, mm, let, let's get yeah. visible is you know the the next step. I think you got to start with let's get digital. Yeah, I agree. The the thing that struck me about about visible about the one that that um, that we were asking about with the categories is that it is very mathematical, and that's what appealed to me. So it, it, I just wonder if you could sort of take us through like you have the the author toolkit in the back, and there's a lot of thought of like where is the 100 mark like within a genre chart what number of sales do you need to reach the 100 and then you talk about predicting how many sales you expect to have via promotion or something so that you know you can chart basically right yeah like the any maths involved is 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 very very basic it just involves um like there's a there's a chart in the back of the book which will tell you roughly how many sales you need to get to hit any particular rank and then you can look at you know the the top hundred for sci-fi dystopian or something, and see that it requires a rank of I, I don't know off the top of my head it, it might require something like ten thousand to hit the back of the chart, and then you'll see that requires a certain amount of sales, and then you can you can plan your promotions around that. 
Um, it, it's also good for for when you're tracking other books, especially those that are that are trying out various uh, promo websites to see if it's worth advertising with them. Because there's there's so many sites out there looking for your advertising dollars, but most of them aren't worth the money, quite frankly. So to give you an idea, if you if anybody's looked at the BookBub promotion page, who has now turned us down twice, which is awesome. Yay. <laughs> so Go BookBub. Awesome. Um, we've we've wanted to do two, and they said no. And they but basically they they say here, and obviously these aren't firm because every book is different. But they say g given a promotion, here's about the number that tends to move. And so if you take that and factor it in, then you can say, well, here's the rank that I'm likely to achieve. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ways that pe the places that people get exposure? Because that was another thing too, the different sorts of lists where. And by the way, this is Amazon centric, generally, right? Generally, yeah. I think about eighty percent of the book covers Amazon, um, and there's there's specific reasons for that. Um, it's a it's a lot harder to get traction on the other retailers because they don't have the same uh, discoverability paths for for readers. Um, like Amazon have all sorts of different lists where readers can discover books. Like it's not just the the top hundred and the top hundred for each uh, each subcategory, but there's also things like the movers and shakers list. There's top rated lists. There's um, and then there's the various spots where books appear when you're when you're checking out when you're purchasing something or just when you log into the site. And a lot of those are are personalized to you and your your browsing and reading and purchasing habits. Um, but all these spots are up for grabs. All, all, virtually all of them, you can you can fight your way in there um, if your if your sales are strong enough or if you're selling to the right readers. And um, so this book was all about breaking down this this whole recommendation system and seeing how you can position your books and tweak your promotions to to best capitalize from that. Um, and that's a lot harder to do at places like Kobo and Barnes and Noble and Apple because they simply don't have all these various places where you can get visibility. Um, do you think that they'll catch up? Yeah, I think they will, but I, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, I don't even know if they're thinking the, the right way about it. Like, uh, they seem to focus on on kind of merchandising, which is like they have a they have in-house teams which they look at sales reports and they'll look at various various books, both self-published and and traditionally published, and they'll they'll try and guess which books can do particularly well if they get if they get a little bit of exposure. But that's a very kind of top-down process where they're they're just looking at raw sales totals, and then they have a team which kind of go through the books and they and they pick them. Um, whereas Amazon, it's it's all completely automated and it's all it's all a, a kind of it's grand behavior. meritocracy. It's all it's all behavior. So like yeah. Do you do you think this is a matter? Do you think that this is a matter of like Amazon having so much money to pour into the tech side of it that nobody else can compete? Well, I mean, money, I mean, this has to be some sort of like genius computer program that just really just get, gets you the book you want. Uh, that that I don't think it's easy to replicate in other places. Gets you, you the book that money. you want that you might not even know you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Amazon's Amazon spent hundreds of millions on web development. I I don't know this for a fact, but I think it's more than anybody. Like, they're they're because. Amazon's the third biggest search engine in the world. Like Google gets so much attention as being a, a large search engine, but if you think about it, Amazon is the third largest, but they're the largest for buyers. Like if you're searching for something on Amazon, there's a chance you're going to open your wallet. So their search results are exponentially more valuable than Google search results. Yeah, well like uh, Amazon have a lot of money to 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 throw at this problem and uh but it's not just about investment because I think there's a kind of a clash of philosophies here. Like I, I, I wrote about this a little bit in, in Let's Get Visible, but um, like companies like Barnes and Noble have, in in my opinion, they've very much taken their traditional book selling mindset online. And you know, if you go into a, a chain bookstore in particular, you'll get assaulted from the front tables by various books that have been handpicked by by the publishers, essentially, not not by the bookseller. Um, this is all co-op, which is all bought and sold. And it's these books aren't there because the manager of the store thought their customers would 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 prefer this book. Those those spots are paid for, and it's quite similar in in their online store in that all the high vis visibility spots are given over to books which publishers essentially pay for those spots. Whereas with Amazon, instead of taking that quick money up front, they've decided to farm out all that visibility to anybody once their book performs well enough. And while they might make less by on the first immediate purchase by recommending a 99 cent book um, instead of something that's traditionally published at 14.99 they might make less in that first initial sale but they know that if customers trust the recommendations more if they use them more 
um, they'll make more money in the long run. And it's, it's, it's the same actual philosophy that Google had in the search engine wars against Yahoo. Yahoo auctioned off the top spots above the search results to the highest bidder, but Google allowed relevancy to become a key factor in deciding which, which ads appeared there. And that's why Google won. And I'm sure Amazon was watching that. And they've incorporated the same philosophy in, into their approach to, to visibility on their site. And, yeah, that's and, so and, well articulated. But this is the reason why why indies often complain that they can't get traction elsewhere because well, the the visibility opportunities simply aren't there. Like I, w- I would have loved if if half of Let's Get Digital was about how to crack Kobo and Apple and Barnes and Noble. But the ball truth is like um, there's there's only a couple of ways to get sales going there, and it's a bit of a roll of the dice. And um, whereas with Amazon, you can if you keep applying this strategy, you will you will get traction eventually. So do you think that uh, Amazon KDP Select is still of value to authors? Um, Great question. Increased significantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, th- that might be our most asked question right now. Too. Yeah, yeah, me too. We've, we've, we've kind of uh, dropped out of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I rolled everything out in, in April, actually, after I had a, I had a big free run. Um, I gave away 20,000 copies of, mm. of my historical, and I had virtually no sales bump afterwards. I, I think I was actually, after three days of kind of mediocre sales. I went back to selling less than I was selling before I gave away 20,000 copies. Hmm. So that was the last draw for me, and I, I rolled everything out and, and uploaded everywhere again. What about in terms of visibility, though, since the whole idea is yeah, to there, rank on... Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, sometimes you hear people complain that they just, they just unenrolled all their books from KDP Select, and all of a sudden sales started to tank, and maybe Amazon did something to me or punished me for, for leaving the program. But they don't, they don't realize that... They, do actually get visibility benefits from being in the program. For example, um, every time your book is borrowed, that counts towards sales rank, but um, which 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 helps you get visible on various charts. But even aside from that, um, the Kindle Owners Lending Library chart is quite a small pool to play in. You know, there's how many books in Select? Around 250,000, I think, out of the the total of 1.7 or 1.8 million, whatever it is now. So. The, call, the Kindle Owners Lending Library charts um, are, are one place where you get a lot of visibility, and it doesn't take a lot of sales or borrows to, to hit the charts because it's such a small subset of the overall amount of books. So people don't realize they're probably getting a few sales a day from appearing in those charts, and then when they pull out of the program, they, they're suddenly not in the charts anymore, so their, their sales will drop. So, yeah, the, 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 the question as to whether it's worth it, uh, for me personally, no. Um, I think for authors that have somewhat established themselves, I think it's lost a lot of its luster. I think there can be some benefit to a new author who has you know, no platform, doesn't have a big blog or a mailing list, doesn't have a lot of backlist titles they're uploading. You know, if it's your first book and you're struggling to get reviews and you're struggling to, to get anywhere, I could see there being some appeal to the program. But in general, I think, it, yeah, I think it's, if you're not getting borrows, I think free is, is, is dying. And... If they don't add something to the program, I think a lot of the savvier self-publishers will leave if they haven't left already. My, my major complaint with uh, the, some of the changes in KDP Select, is well, they were visibility related. So basically, it used to be that if you did really well, you might rank in the top page or something on a genre chart or top 100 free, although that probably is still viable. I don't know. Um, but now, with the way that they've changed, I, I'm seeing this everywhere now. Like I used to see it as a split test where they you have to click a tab to see the top 100 free, meaning you're not visible except to people who specifically say, I want free. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is just the latest step that Amazon have taken, either by accident or design, to, to dampen the power of free. And I'm not 100% convinced it is um, by design, you know, because often a decision can be made by engineers or by a different part of the company, and, and the guys in the KDP Select part of the company won't even know until it's already happened. That's the nature of big companies. But all we really care about, I suppose, is the result, and the result is we're getting less and less return from free. Um, I, I think you guys are well aware of the algorithm changes last year in, in March and May, and you know we're seeing a lot more unpredictable results in the last couple of months, so something may have changed again. Uh, I don't think it's as serious a change as, uh, as what happened last year, but it looks like, it looks like free has taken another hit. Um, yeah, and they started experimenting with hiding the free charts about six months ago, but it looks like they've made that permanent. At least I'm only seeing it, that, that tab hidden mm-hmm. now. And they're starting to 
I, I think I've seen them experiment with it in the UK as well. Long but, term, do you see things like um, like like the chain, like the 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 dampering of, of free? Do you see that as a good thing? Do you see these moves by Amazon as a good thing, at least long term? Um, I I don't tend to freak out when the, when these things happen. I I immediately try and think like, how can I take advantage of this? Yeah. Because I know that large publishers will. Uh, large publishers will, will take about a year to catch up anyway. So if we can move fast and think of a way of take, to take advantage of this, um, it's to our benefit. And I think self-publishers should really approach these challenges like that because um, this constant fog of war is only to our benefit because you know we can move quicker and more nimbly than, than they ever can. And it, it, there were some signs that they were just starting to get a handle on the power of free, that they were willing to kind of experiment with with setting books free. They hadn't fully figured it out yet. They hadn't figured out the algorithms and, and post free bounce and all that kind of stuff. But they were starting to experiment. And you know, with they've got so many books on their slate. If they decide to run spare experiments, they've got they've got the most amazing data to work with. But the problem is that they're very slow to take that step. So like there was there was one recent example when um I think it was just before the release of Dan Brown's new book, they put the Da Vinci code free, I think for two weeks. And I don't know how many downloads it got, but I think Conservatively, you could say it got fifty to a hundred thousand. Five hundred bazillion. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. At least, um, but just the very way they did it showed they didn't really kind of get free yet. Like, for starters, if you were looking for some kind of post-free bounce, you wouldn't put a book free for two weeks. Um, secondly, uh, I was really curious to see the back matter and um, to see what, like, obviously because this was all about grabbing new readers. Um, just before the release of the next book. And the back matter consisted of um, the first chapter of the new book. So, so far, so good, you know. But there was, there was no link to a, a mailing list sign-up. There was no link to the pre-order page on Amazon. Uh, the only web link in the entire back matter was, was to Anchor Books, which I think is the imprint that, that was publishing the book. Um, and when you went to the homepage, there was no mention of Dan Brown or his new release. Yeah, <laughs> you know? that so, is appalling, like, hilarious, and in no way surprising. And yeah, yeah, it's all those things. Like, it's like, so true. Like, it's such a great time for indies. Tens like, of thousands of people reading that, <laughs> reading that sample chapter. And all they had to do is put in one link, one click purchase, done. Like, that's they amazing. Lost so much money. That's just you know? so I, amazing. I have the Kindle version of uh, Stephen King's On Writing, and it doesn't have tabs. <laughs> so, like, come on, guys. I mean, at least try with the digital books. So, like, yeah. it's just... well, I'd be a little bit more forgiving of that because it's a backlist book and it was probably scanned in a mass digitization program. Um, but, yeah, like, along those lines, I read one from uh, um, a great book, actually, by John Scalzi called Old Man's War. I'd never read it, and I got it in that... Uh, do you remember there was that uh, Humble Bundle? They did some... There were, like, yeah. ten superstar science fiction writers and and all that. Anyway, I got the bundle, and I read Scalzi's book, and it was really good. And in the back, they had um, a sample chapter from, from, the, from the sequel, uh, which, again, is, you know, it's, it's good that they had that. And it just said, coming fall 2006. I was like, Whoa. you know, I just I, I got this six <laughs> months ago, you know, coming fall 2006. Like, there was no, again, no mailing list sign-up, no link to the sequel. Like, they should have had a list of all his books with, with clickable links, you know, uh, especially the sequel, especially the one they had the sample chapter for. Um, so yeah, they're still they still don't really get it. I, I I think the problem is a lot of them don't own Kindles. I think if they did, they would notice this stuff, you know. Yeah, but, that's that's a really good point. Yeah. Can, can you go through some of the the different charts because there's the sales rank, there's popularity charts, there's hot new releases, there's also bots. I mean, these are all yeah. places where people can get visibility, and they all like count different things toward their ranking or whatever. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, it's quite a hodgepodge. Um, so you have the the general bestseller list, which uh, everybody knows, the top 100, and that's broken down by category and subcategory. So even even the tiniest subcategory will have its own top 100 list, even if it doesn't have 100 books. Uh, it might go up to 67 or something for some <laughs> of the really small, really small categories. Um, and the only thing that affects your position on those charts is your sales rank, and the only thing that affects your sales rank is sales because there's a lot of people out there that think reviews affected or likes or or genre or I, I heard all sorts of crazy theories price yeah none of these things have any effect on on your sales rank it's only sales and um, sometimes people get a little confused when one book is better ranked than another and yet it appears to be selling less and that's all 
it's often the case that it's just it's the way that system weighs the various sales. So if you sell 20 books in an hour, that'll put you higher in the chart than if you sell 20 books over the course of a whole day or, of course, over, over a whole week. So uh, the recency of the sales is a factor. And, you know, historical sales aren't really worth that much. So once that sale is like three or four or five days old, it doesn't really count that much towards your sales rank anymore. So what that means a few different things. It means that you need a you need more sales to to reach a rank than you do to hold on to it, um, which kind of changes the way you, you might think about promotions. Um, and it also means that um, that historical sales count for nothing. So you you can always overtake a, a, a best-selling book if you get if you get a spike a spike of sales. Um, and so that's 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 the bestseller list. Um, uh, can I mention one more thing that it, I'm I'm mentioning it out of your book, so it counts. Uh, is you mentioned that that if there's if the spike is too concentrated, and I mentioned I ex dis explained this to Sean and and Garrett, the guy who works with us, when we were planning two promos close together, um, we were going to do two promos and, and we're thinking about doing them on the same day. But you mentioned that if you get a huge spike all at once, then the algorithm is such that it'll push that back down if it's not spread out. Is that correct? Yeah, like you know, as soon as people figured out that that recency was a factor, and that if you got if you had twenty five friends and you got them all to buy at two p.m. instead of whenever they felt like it over the week, that would push your book higher in the charts. As soon as people figured that out, which is about ten seconds after Amazon opened <laughs> their store, uh, then people were organizing book bombs. You know, you still hear people doing it where they try and get everyone on their mailing list to buy at the same time, or a group of people to try and try and push them high in the charts. But you know, as soon as people started gaming the system like this, and I say I say gaming the system like in a non-pejorative sense, um, but as soon as they started gaming the system like this, um, Amazon tweaked the algorithms to to recognize a one-off sales spike like that and and push the book down just as quickly. So you'll often see that if you take an ad out at somewhere like BookBub, um, where you get a crazy sales spike way above your average, and then it, it dies like a day or two later, and, and your book can, if you've got nothing else holding it up there, your book can plummet almost as fast. Um, That's so heartbreaking. <laughs> Dude, yeah. this is terrible. This, this, is kind of, this is kind of an in-the-weeds question, but I, 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 it's so granular, but I'm curious about it. So the, the two promos that we were trying to line up were an e-reader news today, 99 cent promotion, and a book mm -hmm. book promo. Now, I don't think yeah. we got either of those. Sean, did, did right. they even do the ENT one? I don't even think we got that. No, they, they didn't, didn't do, do either one. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I think so, they must be very backed up at the moment. I hear yeah. a lot of people complaining. They're not hearing, uh, getting responses to, to ad requests, so I'm, I'm not sure what's happening there. So the idea was to do the two a few days apart, and I'm curious as to whether it would make any difference if you, like BookBub is probably the bigger of the two. Do you think it makes any difference whether you were to do the bigger one first or the lesser one first? Well, I for starters, I wouldn't I wouldn't put them a few days apart. I I would I would run them day after each other if you could, um, because the the algorithm will reward uh, a sustained sales spike um, over a one-off spike. So, for example, let's say let's say you had let's say you were going to get 500 sales from BookBub and another 500 from ENT. Um, if you put both of those on the same day, you'll go higher in the chart, but you'll fall faster afterwards. But if you put them one after the other, you won't go as high in the chart, but you'll hold that. You, you have a better chance of holding that position for longer. It, you have a better chance of arresting that slide and, and not falling as quick. Um, and, and that's why that's why with launch strategy, I I think it's so important to spread out spread out your juice over several days. And and if you're able to if you're able to hold a sales level for three or four days. The system will actually start selling your book for you, and um, I got to see this with, with my last release, of, uh, where I I'd um, put my mailing list on one day and Facebook on another day and blogged on another day, and then I had some guest posts on the fourth day, and on day five, Am Amazon started promoting my book for me and started including me in email blasts to customers, and the book more or less maintained that sales level for another couple of weeks, so that really had a huge impact on sales. Like if you if you can, if you can, like it's great having a one or two day sales spike, but if you can hold that sales level, <laughs> that higher sales level for two whole weeks, it re those sales really start to add up. How can you um, tell the difference between an email blast that's getting wide distribution and something where it's it's like a recommendation engine thing for you specifically because you maybe bought the last book? Yeah, you well, you 
you can't really. You can't. You just have to look at your sales numbers and 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 kind of figure it out from there. Like. There's no real way of knowing whether you're on one of these email blasts or not, unless you unless you're you're getting sales from nowhere and you're not doing anything. Like um, basically, when I when I stopped pushing my book at the end of day four, I could see sales sales drop straight away, I, I, as if I'd taken away the supports and uh, the book was trying to walk on its own two feet and it wasn't quite strong enough yet, you know. But then by that night, because the promo emails I think usually go out um, in the middle of the night, my time anyway, and then overnight I had a massive sales dump. And it, w it wasn't anything I was doing, you know. I I'd done all my promotion. I'd blogged about it. I'd tweeted about it. I I'd no more ads running, and this sales spike came out of nowhere. So that's how I knew it was the, the email system kicking in. I'm curious about releases between. Now, so this is a selfish question, but it will apply to people who are following our model. I think is uh, so. Sean and I. I don't know how much you know about what we do. Dave and Sean, and then Sean and I separately. We each release a book every week. So I'm wondering whether, <laughs> so, but it's, it's a different book each time that's getting our mailing list promotion and so forth. And I'm curious as to what factors are in play there, if any. Well, that's a tricky one. I, I, I can tell you what the optimal way to release, to release a book will be, which is, uh, as I described, you, you want to spread your, whatever juice you have, whatever platform you have, you want to you spread it out over, over three or four days to try and get a consistent level of sales. I guess the same theory would apply. Um, just the thought of releasing a book a week makes my makes my brain melt completely. Um, but I guess right, they're not the target audience isn't the same for all these books, right? And you have like, do you have combined mailing lists? Do you have separate mailing lists? Like, how does Sean, it work on that? Sean end? and Dave's stuff is the same audience, and and Sean and mine is. I think a lot of them overlap, but a lot of them don't because there's more genre differences between those books. Okay. Um, well, yeah, like if, uh, I suppose, I suppose, like doing a serial is uh, it's just like releasing a book on on steroids. You, you know, you're 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 hitting you're hitting you're hitting the same promotional channels every week. Jeez, that's a tough one. I I actually don't know. I don't know what you would do with a serial. I guess you 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 would have to experiment and see what worked best for you. But I they yeah, aren't I even it's, serials. It's hard to. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> it's. Um, yeah, so they may be totally. I mean, the answer may be nothing. The answer may be like, well, that doesn't. That they aren't. There's not really gonna... a system for us yet, dude. That's the whole thing. Like, we need what we need is an app. You you get you get a Collective Inkwell app, and it updates. <laughs> but I, no, I guess the same principles would apply, right? Where you're still looking to get um, a consistent level of sales rather than rather than a one-off spike. So it, it means it means just being a little bit disciplined and not not hitting your mailing list and Facebook and blog and Twitter all on the same day and try and spread that juice out over over three or four days so that you have an equal amount of it. Um, I guess that makes like releasing books your full-time job if you're doing that every week. But I, I guess you could come up with a pretty efficient system after a while. I wonder if I should start posting my new release on my blog on a different day, Sean. I think you should. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah it should definitely go... Um, email, uh, social media list, like they should all be different. What about the, uh, the, the thing that Amazon, I don't know how widespread it is, where it'll notify you of a new book by an author you're following? Anything that like doesn't that? work. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work, which is you know a big problem, especially if readers are signing up to that instead of your own mailing list and then not getting an email. But I, I've signed up to several authors. I haven't got a single, a single email. Like I, I signed up to Ed Robertson's one, and I think he's released like six books since then because he, he, he was doing a serial and I didn't get one email and I, 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 several other authors I'm signed up for and I haven't gotten one email so yeah wow. they, need, they need to fix that <laughs> or else just get rid of it it, yeah, it could it be worse you could be your, your people could be getting notice that somebody else released a book that you actually wrote <laughs> well, yeah or, or that's it what happened be, to us <laughs> oh, that's that's not good. But it could be that they're they're just using it to inform their al their recommendation algorithm for you. So they're 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 just using that as a piece of data to say I like Ed Robertson's books, which is which is really crappy for for authors, I think, because you know readers 
obviously that's going to cannibalize some of the signups to your own mailing list. And yeah, it's false illusion. I mean, so you yeah, have like, to change your mailing list then. You have to change your mailing list to make it more enticing than Amazon's mailing list. <laughs> Sell books cheaper than Amazon. No, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, just um, offer something that Amazon's not offering. Offer like a free story or whatever. I, I think you need to offer personality. I think that, that people... Well, that too, obviously. You know, our stunning personality. <laughs> well, there's, people, there, you know, there's, there's, have a lot of personality. Yeah, There's different I, approaches to to how you run a newsletter. Like, um, I strictly use it just to announce new releases, and I keep I keep the chit chat to a minimum. I just say, "Here's the book, go and buy it," um, and that that seems to work for me. But if I was releasing books as regularly as you guys, um, and you're you're kind of community building as well on top of that through your through your newsletter, um, so that's a different kind of approach. But I, I've heard some authors saying that they weren't going to set up a mailing list now because Amazon have this feature. And obviously that's, that's not such a bad move. Yeah, it's such a bad move because for starters, like you Amazon aren't going to sell them, you know, the Barnes and Noble and, and Apple editions of your books. And secondly, it's it's not bloody working. Uh, and thirdly, like you want to have a list that you can control. Um, it's crop sharing. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, and and I and because of you know the best way to launch books being this what I've outlined about spreading spreading it out over several days. You, you have no control about when Amazon emails people. Like you want you want them to buy it in the first few days that it's out. They mightn't get around to emailing someone until a week or two later. I think they're waiting a year, judging from my <laughs> emails. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't got a single one, so that's yeah. They really need to fix that or get rid of it. So where do you think the uh, the, the the chicken slash egg line is in terms of if you get more visibility? In theory, you'll get more sales, but you need to like if you have a book and it gets a lot of visibility, it's not a foregone conclusion that it's going to keep racking up sales, which will then give you sales rank, which will then give you visibility. I assume at yeah. some point you just have to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, like if you don't have those basics in place, like you know, a cover which speaks to the genre, a price which is attractive, you know, a, a well-written sample, a clean formatting. All the usual stuff. If you don't have that stuff, you're you're going to underperform any time you get that visibility. So you really need to have all those basics in place to to maximize any visibility that comes your way. And and also, you know, um, if you're if you're not being visible to the right people, um, it's not going to do you much good either. So there's no point putting your book in a category where you can chart if if you don't respect the various genre conventions, like you know. Um, if you don't have a happy ending at the end of a romance, you're going to get slaughtered in, in the reviews. <laughs> so you, you've got to be very careful that the categories that you're putting your book into, it, it is suitable for. Um, and I can't remember the question. <laughs> what was what was the original question again before I started off on a tangent? Oh, I was just wondering about... Um, I, I, it's, it's a sustainability question. So, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. we... Yeah. Okay, so... Um, Visibility doesn't te generally tend to drive enough sales on its own to keep you there. Otherwise, books would never move, right? Um, and what we see on the Amazon list is is a lot of churn. We, we see books dropping out of the charts and new ones taking their place all the time. So because you have all these other books which are doing their own promotions and their own attempts to, to get visible and their own free runs, you'll constantly have books like leapfrogging yours, like, like, a, like a, a bunch of hungry salmon jumping over yours and trying to push it down. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, visibility will never be self-sustainable, but um, by doing things like choosing choosing the right categories and keywords and all that kind of stuff, uh, you can make that slide, the inevitable slide back into the primordial ranking ooze. You, you can make that slide a little bit slower, and um, because that's that's when you really make money. I, I don't I don't think a lot of authors realize this. They they kind of look at promotions um, as a single day kind of thing, whereas you you often really make make your money in the week or two afterwards when you're back at full price. Um, and it all depends on how how fast you you slide back to where you were before. Um, but you know if you if you're in the right categories and 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 all that, and you use various techniques, you can you can arrest that slide, and that's that's really crucial that period, the week or two after promotion, when you can really make money. I would think that. Uh having high visibility would also make any sales that you do much more effective. If you, you have a book that's normally priced at 5 bucks, you change it to 99 cents, I would assume you automatically get more buy-in if you're more visible. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, like, you know, price alone isn't isn't a discovery tool, at least not anymore. Um, a couple of years ago, you could put your book at 99 cents, and that would almost be enough because there were so many sites out there that were that were hungry for, for deals and 
this before select and so many books were free and they were hungry for deals and they would they would look around for any books that had dropped in price and you would you literally wouldn't have to do anything you could drop your drop your price and and sales would just take off but now there's 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 too many free books competing for attention and there's too many other 99 cent books so you need to do something other than just drop your price so you know you can do a group promotion with authors or you can take out an ad on bookbub or ent but you need something else with that price drop it's not going to make much difference on its own but yeah like w while you're visible in the charts and and you're at 99 cent that's like that's a, it's an auto click for a lot of people because you have the social proof of being in the charts they see that your book is up there along with you know authors they may be more familiar with um and yeah it 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 it, it definitely helps it definitely now, helps fa it, while, while you're doing say a book well or ENT promotion and you have a book for say 99 cents does it does it help an author to also put other books on sale at the same time and maybe mention those in your release or on your author product page? That's what Ed does. Or, yeah, very or, much so. Or, or does it, and how long after would you leave your book at the discounted rate and how quickly should you bring it back up? Because we, we tended to leave it, you know, 99 cents for a few days after the fact and, you know, just keep gathering the sales. Yeah. Is that a bad move? Should we just raise the price right back up and, no, I think I think generally that that's a reasonable approach. Um, it 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 depends what you're looking for with that particular book. Like, are you looking just to maximize sales or or income? Like, if Exposure, it's exposure, you know, get people yeah. into the funnel basically. Like, if they yeah, like exactly. this, they'll get the next one. So if it's if it's the first book in in the series, then you might be looking to maximize sales rather than income. So then then you might be okay letting it run at ninety nine cent a little longer. Like when I released Let's Get Visible, I dropped Let's Get Digital to ninety nine cent, and originally I'd planned to let it let keep it at ninety nine cent for four or five days, and then and then just see what happens. But it, sales were so strong, and it, I really felt that it was it was helping to drive sales. I think people were picking up both books at the same time. I got that impression. Um, so I kept it for for like two weeks at 99 cents and before putting the price back up. So you kind of have to watch it and play it by ear and judge it on a case by case basis. Um, in other cases, it can be good to raise price straight away, depending on depending on your genre. Like like in historical fiction, um, the last time I I hit the top 20 in historical fiction, uh, my book looked out of place with, at 99 cents. Everything else was 7.99 or higher. And I, I think sometimes in, in cases like that, especially in a genre where readers are less price sensitive, um, I think sometimes 99 cent can work against you. So in that case, if all the other books around you are much more expensive, if all the books in your also bots are much more expensive, if you're the only one at 99 cent, maybe it's a good idea to raise it to 4.99 straight away. But in, in most cases, in most genres, that won't be the case. The, like in, in romance, for example, readers are so price sensitive still that um, you might be better off leaving at 99 cent for a while and taking as many many readers in as as you can while you're visible now now I had a personal question for you as I I, I found you via your short stories which are sci-fi horror I'm not sh quite sure how to label it can oh I already like where you are but but I, I I loved those two stories. I'm not big in historical fiction. I did buy your book. I didn't read it yet. No offense. <laughs> uh, but I but I did want to support you, so I bought the book, and I'm sure it's awesome. But my question for you is, wh why shift into historical if you've you've already sold a few short stories? Why not Why not write a longer form of this kind of same thing you're doing because you already have those readers? Why get in, I mean, all right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> what the hell am I doing? Basically, is, is the question. Uh, do, yeah. do, 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 do you do you think that that was a mistake to do that then, uh, or was it? A, or is it good to broaden your genres early, or or kind of should you? Do you, do you think you should have made another sci-fi book uh, in, in the genre, or do you think it's good to you know change up real early and get people used to different things from you? Well, it it depends. Like you know, if if you're looking at it in purely commercial terms, what I did was was pretty brain dead. I think my first four releases were in four different genres, um, but you know, I I just write what I want, what I want to write, and I don't really like rules. And uh, you know, if someone tells me I should do this, I'm I'm so contrary. I'll probably just do the opposite, just just because you know. Um, but yeah, in in terms of like building a career and building a readership, it's better to stick to one genre. There's no doubt about it. Um, but then there's no harm. There's no harm like dabbling in a couple of different genres. Like, 
I think like there's plenty of authors out there that started in one genre and then just tried a book in another genre and that was the breakout book that took off for them. So yeah, I I I, I don't really mind because I I feel like I'm at such an early stage. Um, like there's there's so many more books I want to write. There's, there's several different genres I, I want to write in. I'm not obsessing that much about where I am in terms of the size of my readership or how much I'm making. As long as like as long as I'm just about surviving and I can write and I have time to write, I'm 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 pretty happy with that. Um, but I have more sci-fi stuff coming out soon. As I, well, as soon as I finish it, um, I'm writing something at the moment that was going to be a short story, and but I just can't seem to finish it. Um, so it's turning into a short novel, um, and that's kind of a near future dystopia, dark comic reality show mm. kind of thing. Uh, and you, you're and also going to. I haven't written. I haven't written the blurb yet, as you might might have been able to guess. And you're you're also going to write something for for the Beam story we're doing, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Awesome. Okay, so I'm cool. I'm on a bit of a sci-fi kick at the moment. So, and then I've got a, another historical novel, which is well, I won't say it's finished. It's about two drafts away from being finished, but it's it's it, it's in the pipeline. Um, so do you find a lot of cross? Of do you find a lot of crossover? Okay, you you write you know you're writing for the the self-publishing crowd you're writing for the sci-fi horror and you're writing historical fiction how much crossover is there do you know do you have a do you have a sense of that i i, I don't think there's a huge amount but there there's some um it's hard to know like and, I, and do you have i'm sorry do you have three separate mailing lists too <laughs> no, what I you don't, can't don't know is that these are such loaded questions for no, Sean. No, I'm, really, I'm not <laughs> trying to bring it back to us i i think <laughs> i i agree that you guys won that debate i'm i'm asking specifically for david i've always wondered this so Go ahead. Uh, no, I, do, I, I don't actually. I, I have I have one I have one super mailing list for for everything. Um, I figured. I I I yeah. There might be some people annoyed that just want to get news about self-publishing books, and they get an email about a short story. But I I don't think you know an email isn't that intrusive, especially if it's a list you've already signed up for. And if someone gets you know someone that only likes sci-fi stuff gets an email about my historical stuff, I don't think they're going to mind that much. They just won't click on it, you know. Mm -hmm. So. I figured it was it was better to have one list. Yeah, I think I think volume changes that for us. Like, where it, it, Sean it's, was it's, perching on the microphone the whole time. I could see him. He's like moving forward. Like <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> it's all fine. Yeah, because the the funny thing is, David, we 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 love genre hopping. Like, we totally get it. Which is part of the thing that I think makes it less suicidal for us is that we're um we we do publish every week, so we can afford to genre hop and we're still creating enough content to feed people who just want this type of thing or this type of thing. Um, and that's, that's, that's a lot of fun, but yeah, this is one of our most regularly visited <laughs> topics of discussion. John, uh, Dave's wanted to do dark horror and pretty much um, only dark horror and quick aside to the SPP crowd. When we were on the phone with the producers, we said we wrote dark horror and then the guy goes dark horror. <laughs> no, the, I think it was a lady that said that, and I said, oh, yeah, was, not not with a W." Yeah, it was the lady, and it was when I was describing for Nevermore, which I described as YA. She said, "Dark whore, That doesn't sound very YA. That, that reminds me when I I, I was backpacking and I, I was talking to someone in a hostel, and um, I think I was I was scribbling away on some kind some some book at the time in in, in the foyer of the hostel, and I got talking to somebody, and they asked me what I did, and I told them I was a writer. And then she started with all these questions like, like you know, are, are you able to make any money from that? And I was like, well, not at the moment, but hopefully in the future. <laughs> and, then, and she kept asking all these really strange questions, and I, I couldn't understand where she was coming from. And then she said, aren't you a bit tall to be a jockey? And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> she thought I said rider, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic. How much traveling have you done? You seem like a very worldly guy, the exact opposite of me that never leaves my house. <laughs> Oh, only for Target. He only leaves for Target. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done lo done lots of traveling. Um, I've lived in South America a couple of times uh, and traveled around there a good bit. Southeast Asia as well, all over Europe. I've I've lived and worked in a load of different countries now. At this point, you got to write an autobiography, man. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> I have uh, I have one final question, and then we will will finally release you from this purgatory that you're in. <laughs> And that's, do you have any insight into discoverability across, because people say things like, uh, you know, somebody gets one of your books, they're going to discover your other books because they liked what they just read or something. I'm just wondering if there's anything at all that 
you, you could tell us about discoverability of your other books in your back catalog relative to you know a sales spike in one. Is there any of that? Um, in the sense that, like, how to encourage spillover? Is that is that is that what you're? What I you're guess asking? it's really more: is there spillover? I mean, I would assume there is. I'm just wondering if there's anything that we don't know about that. Maybe the answer is no. Um, yeah, I like. I think you know some readers are adventurous and some aren't. Some just want sci-fi dystopias. Some just want sweet romances. Um, I think. Hmm. But if you yeah. are a single genre, I mean, I'm not. This is agnostic of the multiple genres discussion. Just wondering, like, if Dave only writes dark horror, you know, somebody gets a David Wright book and they say, "I'm going to go buy all of David Wright's books." <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think there's some, and like, I used to put, I used to put a sample in the back of my books of. You know, crazy unrelated stuff. Like in the back of <laughs> Digital, I think I had a sample for my historical novel, and in the back of like, in the back of the historical novel, I had a sample for a science fiction short story. Mm. But I, you know, I was really trying to push people across to different stuff. But you know, I don't think there was a huge amount of crossover. I think I have a small group of core readers that will kind of buy more or less uh, anything that I publish. But I think the kind of more casual ones, the ones that wouldn't really like sign up to your mailing list or your blog or whatever, I don't think they move across as more as much. I think that's okay though. You have circles of of people. You have your core group who will buy anything. You have a, a satellite group that'll get certain genres. You have people beyond that that'll try stuff every once in a while. I think yeah. the most important readers to have are the readers who won't shut up. You know, like the mavens, the ones who want to tell all their friends about what they just read. You know, those people are on Facebook and they're on Goodreads, and like those are the people. They're in the forums on Amazon. Like, I, I think, and and it's hard to know how to get to that group of people, but that's the group of people that you want reading your stuff. If you can, yeah. Well, you, you just got you, you got to make make it easy for them to 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 connect with you and share your stuff. Like, I I read so many books where. You know, even even if the author does have a sign up for their mailing list and maybe clickable links to their other books, they don't have a link to their Facebook page or to their blog or to their website. You know, you, you got to make it easy for these for these kind of power readers to to go and share your stuff. Like, you know, if they've got to Google something or look it up, like you, you you've got a big chance of losing them. So you know, have everything there in the back of your books, like like your link to your Twitter, your Facebook, um, everything. You know, and let them choose how they want to connect with you. They yeah. might want to sign up to your mailing list, but they might want to, they might want to follow you on Twitter, or they might want to subscribe to your blog, or whatever. Give them the choice. Yeah, give them as many options as you can afford to maintain. Yeah, totally. All right, well, um, let's 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 finish on that. I just want to thank so much for first of all hanging in with the tech difficulties, <laughs> and then for for being on the show. Um, I think that we can all agree that uh, David Gogren's book, Let's Get Visible is a must read for anybody. Who, oh yeah, if you listen to yeah. this podcast and you haven't read it or or don't plan to read it, that's 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 a dumb move. Like I'll, yeah. I'll, also check out his blog. People ask us what we read a lot and his is one of our regular reads. David Gogren, that's G A U G H R A N dot wordpress dot com. Is that correct, David? Uh, no no dot in between the name and the WordPress, I think. Oh no, there is. Yeah, David davidgochran.wordpress.com or if you okay. just google my name it'll, it'll come up first yeah. and and great, blog, Johnny, though. great blog in the Johnny B. Truant algorithm recommendation e engine I would say that if you like Ed Robertson <laughs> move over and also pay yeah the, the bottom line is if you're if you're listening to the show then you probably are as interested or at least partly interested in, in selling books as much as writing books because they are two different things and there's a lot of books out there about writing books but books about selling books it's a different ball game now so there aren't as many relevant voices and this is as relevant as you can get or and relevant voices that you can actually trust that aren't talking about the gold rush yeah so <laughs> so so this is this is um i guarantee you he knows more than you he, he knew a lot more than me <laughs> and um i was really grateful to learn a few things and so absolutely you should pick it up so thanks again. Uh, David's book, Let's Get Visible, is, I, the short link is selfpublishingpodcast.com slash visible. And, uh, and just thanks again. It's been, it's been great having you on. Thanks for having me, guys. It was great. Thank All you. right. So Adios. we'll finish, finish up. Oh, I, and there I can't even play the music there. Okay, so um, there it goes. I got it. Uh, so th this has been the Self Publishing Podcast. Uh, if you, uh, sorry on the voicemails. Like I said, we're kind of behind on those, but we'll catch up. And um, if you enjoy the show, a rating on iTunes would be much appreciated. And if you've been waiting for the beam, it is now available. Available. So there you go. Uh, thanks, everybody. We'll catch you on the next show. <laughs>